All right, um, let me go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, so this might be a pretty short session today. Um, I thought I would review the assignment four. I did just get that uh, turn return back to people. Uh, so we'll go over that first. Uh, and then I had a couple things to talk about kind of going forward here. So uh, just to give a kind of an overview of the kind of the, the how we're gonna be wrapping up the course and some things like that. So. So, um, like I said, let's let, let's let's start with the sign. I had a few things to say, but but probably not a whole lot. Um, I uh, returned back the assignment four for everybody, um, and I posted this example solution that I'll go ahead and um, work through here. Um, so, uh, everybody was fine on the first part. Um, um, I, uh, I mean, I'll remind again. I mean, do do make certain that you're using the 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 doc strings for Python. So that's you know these things between the triple quotes. You know, so in general, whenever you're documenting code, documenting functions, you should always document. You, know, you should have, always have like a description. Document the input parameters to your function. Um, and I see that I missed one here. Um, so. Um, Um, Sigma is basically the standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution being used, right? Uh, anyway, I mean, m most people have this. Most people were basically doing an iterative method like this. So you so took the sum and did a, um, um, a for loop to sum over these, right? Um, it is possible to directly um, implement this. And if you directly implement this, the um, um, using uh, like, like the norm, like for example, from the, uh, from NumPy's linear algebra um, function, um, you can completely vectorize the solution for the Gaussian kernel, right? So anyway, I mean, th these are equivalent, uh, but but you know, majority of people were doing this, which is fine to take any points off of that for that. Uh, but you know, as usual, you know, whenever you can, if you can vectorize your code, it's going to be much more efficient. Um, so, so it'll perform faster uh, in, in NumPy if you have a purely vectorized solution instead of having something that iterates over uh, and does calculations using some sort of an iteration, right? It's always something to strive for. So here, here's an implementation. I mean, this is directly uh, implementing the, uh, the the first expression here. So the x e raised to the negative of this fraction, where you take the norm of the xi and the xj, which are basically vectors here. So, so you take the norm of that um, um, just difference, square it, um, and then you divide by two times the square of that sigma parameter, right? Raise, uh, take e to the negative of that, and you've got your result, right? And, and it does it in a vectorized way, even though xi and xj um, are actually um, vectors of, um, of, of sample points here. You know, so you've got in sample points that we've labeled one to n here, right? So, but it works um, just fine to, to take the difference of those and norm them. You get the same result here and, and square that norm. So. Um, So anyway, you, can, you can compare that with your with your own work. So, but but most everybody had something that was working, was actually calculating what was asked for here. Um, this, this basic Gaussian kernel. Okay. So remember, um, I talked a little bit about this last week when I talked about kernels. So I mean, this implements um, that that Gaussian kernel function that we we're talking about. So you know, it's in multiple dimensions. So it's hard to visualize when you have more than um, um, two dimensions for your um, um, uh, the, the the points that you have or, or, or right um, but you know you get the same sort of form right so it's, it's kind of a measure of similarity and you know then you know this is a perfectly good kind of thing that we can use 
uh, for the kernel trick for support vector machine, right? And another thing we talked about, uh, this isn't used in a lot of other machine learning methods, the, this kernel trick, um, because um, um, for various kind of technical reasons, um, it can be done efficiently to do kernels like this for support vector machines, um, and it's not quite so easy to do it efficiently uh, for, uh, for other kinds of machine learning um, algorithms. So, so the reasons why those technical reasons are a little bit beyond the scope of this class, we, we, we got into them a little bit, or if you watch Dr. Ng's videos, um, um, tries to get a little bit of a, a reason for that as well. Um, um, anyway, another thing that this assignment was trying to show you is that um, the, the, the Gaussian kernel is really just a special case of the general radial basis functions, okay? So one particular type of radial of, of settings for the radial basis functions will give you Gaussian kernels, okay? Um, so basically that, that, that gamma parameter um, for a radial basis function when it's 1.0, um, that, so that's a particular case that gives you a, a standard Gaussian kernel like we built here. So in theory, if, if, if you followed um, what I asked for here, you should get exactly identical decision boundaries being made, whether you're using the uh, built-in um, support vector classifier uh, using a, um, um, Sorry, using a um, um, where did I have it in the oh yeah here so so using uh, the the radial basis functions so so here you know if you create a support vector classifier using radial basis functions and you use the gamma as I talked about right so so so. To, to get the same sigma that we want to use, uh, gamma has the relationship to sigma of this, right? So if you plug in, if we want to use a sigma of, of 0.1, um, uh, you have to plug that in there and that works out to a gamma of 50, right? So, so if, if you use it with a gamma of 50, like here, or a gamma uh, plugging that in with the, the sigma, you should get, you know, a decision boundary that looks something like this, if you use the same uh, data here. So, um, you can kind of figure that out again, if you look through the, um, 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 the, the, the documentation for the support vector classifier, you know, so, so it kind of tells, describes a little bit about what this gamma parameter does, right? Um, so, um, so these are the kernel coefficients for radial basis function. Uh, actually, you probably can't get the details from here. You'd have to go uh, and read about uh, somewhere um, about um, uh, radial basis functions and exactly what that, what that, um, gamma parameter does um, in order to figure out its relationship between it and sigma and, and why um, the radio basis functions with this particular value of gamma is a special case uh, of, of, of a standard Gaussian kernel, basically. So, um, but, but yeah, so I, I didn't really want to get into that. So um, the, the kind of maybe the last thing that I did want to talk a little bit about, um, some people did notice that um, um, I, I don't know if, if, if everybody quite understood the purpose of this last part here, but that it was supposed to illustrate that, that you get exactly the same result, whether you use your hand-built Gaussian kernel or you use the radial basis function with that particular set of values to get a sigma of 0.1, right? Another thing that some people did notice was that um, um, calculating this decision boundary using uh, the mesh grid and um, a contour plot could be slow. Um, the reason why it was slow for some people, uh, well, I mean, part of the reason is, you know, if you were using the non-vectorized version, but that didn't really add 
that probably didn't add enough uh, slowdown to make it uh, perceptible. So that wasn't the real reason why it was slow or something. Um, a lot of people were um, um, subtracting a lot larger, adding and subtracting a lot larger of a, um, like a buffer between the min and max on the X and the Y, you know. So, so, so to do this, if you were following the example, but finding the min and max, for example, on the X, that would ensure that you create a mesh grid that, that gets all of the point, right? And you can add and subtract a little bit from those in order to, um, um, you know, make certain you have a little bit here. Some, some people were like adding and subtracting one, right? Um, and what happens if you do that, um, let, me, let me kind of split this up here. Let me cut this out here and put this, um, down below here. So um, in the example solution, I just added and subtracted like the step size or a very small amount as, as a buffer, right? So it's a really, this is pretty close. Uh, you'll end up with the, the, the maximum point being pretty much right there. It's really not much or any buffer. I could have probably got the same result if I hadn't subtracted that at all, right? But, but the problem is if, if you were following the same example, we were using a range, right? So, so if you make the value between the min and the max larger, you're gonna get more points cut up for your X and your Y, right? So um, if you use it like this, for example, you, we get um, um, a 61 by 98 shape for X's and Y's, right? Uh, for both, you can get the same shape for both of these, right? But basically that gives you um, 5,978 points that need to be evaluated, right? So, so when you when you um, put that into the um, uh, the predict function, um, you're predicting. You know, um, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that large, but but um, um, there's enough computation happening that um, um, this can take a little bit of time to do the prediction, right? Uh, but the, the the big the big thing was is that um, you know if you, if you made your buffer bigger, let's say add and subtract one, um, that has a significant impact. So it, it's it's a it's a multiplication kind of a thing here, right? Or it's it's a it's, it's a square. Uh, um, you know, since, since we're doing it as a, um, um, a matrix with, with two dimensions here. So you get significantly more points on one dimension since you're increasing the buffer, right? And then you multiply that together. So now you get um, in this instance. So, so we went from like 5,000 to 76,000. Right, it's really the square um, uh, of the relationship here. Right, so th this is a lot more work that needs to be done, and it's a lot more work for really no advantage. Right, so in fact, if I do, I mean, some people were reporting that it might take an hour or something or longer. Um, I mean, they gave up kind of trying to do it. Right, so I don't, I don't want to do that. So, but but the 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 you know the other thing is that really it's not necessary because that buffer all you're calculating is the stuff. Uh, to the left and the right of where the actual data points are. And that's all always going to be one of the classes pretty much, right? So, so you're not gaining any information by doing something like that, right? So really, and in fact, in this case, because the ca calculation ends up being kind of expensive, uh, I mean, having no buffer at all might be justified because you really just need to see the decision boundary uh, where your points are actually at, right? So, um, yeah, I'm actually, I ended up with the same result in terms of the number of points that we end up on the grid. And when I have a, a small buffer, right? But um, um, anyway, I mean, you know, still, you know, when you're evaluating 5,000, 6,000 points, it'll still take a little bit of time. I mean, I've got a relatively, um, relatively powerful computer here uh, that uh, has plenty of memory and, and a relatively new CPU and it still will take, you know, a minute or two to do this. But, but yeah, if, if you're going, um, uh, what is it? Uh, 
5,000 up to 75,000. So that's significantly more points. Um, it can take quite a bit longer to um, calculate your decision boundary here. So that was what was happening for some people here. Um, Hopefully this will come back here and we'll see the, the result here. But um, um, oh, because, because we're using our built-in function instead of the, uh, we're, built, we're using our function that we did by hand instead of the, the built-in RBF function. I mean, also that's another thing is it's probably, I mean, the, the, the radio basis functions are probably, um, highly optimized, right? So, so we can see a significant difference in how long it takes to, to calculate the contours on this mesh grid versus you know, when we use the, um, the classifier with the built-in um, radio basis function from, um, it comes out, comes back quite a bit more quickly. <laughs> um, we do like that. The, the other thing is because um, um, it's probably not really the, the Gaussian kernel so much, even if you were using a non vectorized, is because I don't have the, this function uh, vectorized. So that's probably where the main, um, and, and you know, if I went back and thought about it, there, there's probably some way to, to, for me to get this vectorized. But, but here's another example. You know, so so I, I kind of pinged you guys, but, um, um, but, but here in the code, um, I didn't have it vectorized um, either. Um, in this case, you know, we're actually using a nested loop. So we had to do it like that because um, that's what the, um, um, the, the, the function that you pass in is expecting, that you will give it um, You will give it um, basically a matrix of these, right? So, so these come out as um, um, like a like what uh, an I by J shaped matrix here. Um, and you have to return the result in that same um, shape uh, matrix, uh, which is kind of what we're doing here. But, but like I said, if, if, I, if I, or, or maybe if you, one of you guys thought about it, there's probably a way to, to vectorize the, even this nested loop in here, which should make it significantly faster to you know calculate um, our decision boundary mesh grid here um, you know, the, the, in the same speed that the, uh, Scikit so learns radio basis functions um, are doing as well. Um, um, all right, so I think that's all I had to say about assignment four. Um, I, I posted this example solution. You can you can look at it um, on your own to kind of compare with your own work there. So the main the you know the main point was just to, to make certain that. Everybody understood kind of support vector machines and um, um, kind of how these kernel functions work at a high level of understanding, right? And and um, what they're doing, you know, kind of what, what a linear uh, support vector classifier is doing versus um, something that's using uh, uh, that's doing a, a nonlinear calculation using something like kernel functions and all that, right? So like I like I said before in, in previous lectures, I kind of mostly think of the kernel trick as doing a similar thing to the um, uh, creating polynomial features, right? So we're, we're we're adding in those, and that allows us to create um, a nonlinear decision boundary, even though we're using the same mechanism at the lowest level of fitting um, a function to a, a set of parameter features. So so finding the parameter features that minimizes our cost function um, over the you know over the, the slightly different version of the cost function that the, the support vector machine uses. Um, 
All right, so yeah, let's let's kind of wrap that up. So that was it for assignment four. So like I said, looking ahead, I mean, I already, last week, I already kind of looked through the notebook for um, uh, ensemble learning, although it doesn't have a lot uh, in there yet. Um, so, you know, yeah, I'm kind of running out of time to kind of add, get some new material in here. I haven't really been able to get some newer stuff in uh, here yet. So you mostly had to read the chapter, um, um, seven on the ensemble learning um, and look through the notebook that I had. Um, I didn't I didn't want to go over that again. Um, although I did post some links to some additional things. So you know um, if you are looking for even more kind of uh, materials uh, in order in order to um, get better at sort of the bagging, the boosting, the stacking that's talked about in the ensemble learning. Um, I recommend uh, either or these two sites. The Kegel site has some example code, um, which would be really good to go through and actually run and do, right? Kegel, th these are both good resources for people that want to learn to get into being a, a data analyst or a data scientist. Uh, so Kaggle is a competition site, but it has lots of um, materials and resources uh, for learning about machine learning and data science. Likewise, this Torch Data Science is another site uh, that I use a lot uh, to get examples from and things. Um, um, I thought I would kind of mention the, 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 um, the Kaggle site that I had just uh, given there. Um, uh, just go through again. The, the, the reason why this, so up to this point in this course, we've covered basically the the, the main, um, so, so to kind of to wrap up a bit here, you know, um, we've covered the ma main supervised learning, machine learning algorithms, okay? So so linear and logistic regression. And then, you know, we, we've looked at, um, 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 Hey, nearest neighbors and Bayesian um, um, classifiers. Um, um, not not in a lot of depth. We looked, at, we looked at a little bit more depth for support vector machines and decision trees, right? Um, and then um, we've uh, we also had a little bit of material from our textbook about uh, bagging, boosting, and stacking about ensemble methods. Okay. And the only thing that we really haven't talked about are like neural networks and deep learning. And I purposely leave those out because um, we um, uh, cover those in depth um, on our deep learning class um, in this degree program, right? And I encourage you again, I posted an announcement about that. Uh, I'd really like to get some more people in that class. It's a really good follow-up to this class, right? So if you're, if you're into, um, want to get into and become a data scientist uh, with the, the, the degree that you're Purdue, pursuing um, from our degree program. Uh, these are really good courses to, to, to um, um, study in depth and, and, and try and go beyond the, the material that we have uh, in the course here, right? So um, um, yeah, and, and, and you know, like I mentioned before, we kind of pick right up um, from where we leave off on our uh, in this course, looking at neural networks and then deep neural networks and just concentrate on all those uh, for a whole semester in the deep learning course. So, um, so really, I mean, I would kind of say that uh, uh, sort of random forests and ensemble methods like bagging and boosting uh, along with deep learning uh, tend to be the, the, the ones that are um, the, the best performers in terms of creating models. Uh, in order to uh, uh, make predictions about a set of data, right? So if you go and look, for example, at the cable competitions, you'll see that a, a lot of the winners are, are using bagging boosting um, or are using deep learning, right? So uh, bagging boosting or stacking or some combination of those, often in combination. So, so maybe uh, we'll be using a couple of different variations of deep learning models that they stack uh, or bag together in order to build their final um, um, predictor. Those are often the things that are kind of coming out as the best um, on different Kegel competitions right now as of you know, the, the past year or two, past couple of years. Um, 
So these are all good to learn some more about, right? Um, so in terms of bagging, boosting, stacking, um, and again, I'm, I'm not gonna go through a depth on this, um, but um, um, you know, we did cover this and our textbook covers this, you know, so, so bagging, uh, bagging and boosting, really usually uh, people are using um, homogenous models. So by that, I mean, we're, we're using a collection of models of the same types. So, so, so like in this, often we're using um, different, um, for example, um, decision trees, right? So really a, a random forest is really kind of a formalization of, of bagging um, because a, a random forest is really just uh, creating a bunch of, of decision trees um, um, you know, so, so it's homogenous in that, say, in that case, uh, in that sense, they're all the same type of machine learning algorithm. And, and, and basically then a, a random forest um, is doing kind of what bagging is described here, what we talked about before, um, where it trains it on, on different, maybe different samples of the input data so that you get some variations. And also you might vary the parameters for the individual decision trees, and then you're doing some sort of um, aggregation on the predictions, right? Um, so, so uh, like a voting, like we talked about, majority or um, 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 or some other more sophisticated, where where you might be using um, some sort of weighting um, on your voting based on the um, the um, confidence score that, that some sorts of classifiers are able to produce about how confident they are in their prediction, right? Um, again, I, I think then the boosting um, also tends to use um, homogeneous models, so models of the same type. Um, as far as I know, there's there's no kind of similar thing, like, like so random force is really a formalization of, of uh, a very common type of bagging, basically. Um, so I don't know if, if there's a similar thing, you know, like like that. The, the, this is an example of, of boosting, right? So boosting, you know, the, the main difference is that we're taking the the uh, predictions in, in a sequence instead of kind of in parallel and then aggregating those, right? Um, so and 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 again, uh, I don't know if I quite. I agree with this, or it's not quite exactly the way that I usually think of it. So it describes here that for boosting the last layer of the model, we use the predictions from all the previous layers. I mean, I don't think I don't think they mean that they use the predictions directly. I mean, you get the the, the prediction from that whatever your last model is, um, and um, you know it's using the prediction from the previous one, and so on, right? So yeah, in this case though, you're you're training models to not use the original data, but to use um, the output of predictions um, um, maybe in combination with the, the, the input training data or not um, in some way. So. Um, So, and then stacking, um, again, you know, this would be tougher to have sort of um, a, um, a, a, an off the shelf kind of thing, because usually what people mean by stacking, and, and this is my understanding of it, is, is, is if we're using non-homogenous, so if we're using models of different types, right? So here, I, I mean, and, and though it can be a matter of, definition what you consider you know models of different type you know so if i'm using like like a um a convolutional network and a recurrent neural network i mean in one sense those are both kind of examples of deep learning but they're they're really very different types of, of deep learners of neural networks right so i don't know if you consider those homogenous or not homogenous in that case if the only difference between stacking and bagging is that in, in the one case you're using more things that are more homogenous in this case you're using things that are um, 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 more heterogeneous heterogeneous weak learners so, so different learning algorithms um, I, I guess the the other main difference might be those that um, um, 
I think for stacking often we train a, another kind of more standard classifier to take the, the um, outputs, the predictions from your collection of learners um, and then come up with a final, yeah, like, like a, a final prediction, you know, so it's a kind of a meta learner here. So that's, that, that tends to be a little bit more of, of a more complicated stack than just than what we, what, what I normally think of when, when I'm talking about bagging, which is usually just aggregating, you know, some sort of, sort of voting or, or weighted voting, right? Um, so, so yeah, for, for um, uh, stacking, you know, it can be a bigger, a, a, a common big difference is, yeah, you're actually training another, uh, usually a more straightforward kind of classifier, you know, linear regression or um, logistic classifier or something like that to be the meta learner from some more sophisticated models that you get their their outputs from so um so yeah i mean you know we discussed this before and from our textbook you know so so why you might use an ensemble learning i mean usually you you want to do basic things first and see how far you can get with just a you know a, a straightforward decision tree or straight, straight, straightforward um, um, support vector classifier or something like that. And then, you know, once you've gotten um, some idea about how you can do with, with, with certain things uh, and you want to start, you know, trying to eke out the best performance that you can, then you might want to start building ensembles. And that seems to be, again, if you look at the Kago competitions, kind of the winners, that, that, that seems to be the approach, you know. So, so, so the ones that do win that are using ensembles, you know, have, have kind of built up um, um, some basic ones and then start um, um, combining them together to eke out another percentage or half a percentage point of performance. And that, that's often the difference between being kind of in the, in the middle of the path and being somewhere at the top, um, you know. So. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the reason why I probably recommend, you know, so I always think it's best to, you know, actually look at some code examples. So the Kegel one does have some, some examples of doing the banking, boosting, and stacking on some um, particular things. I haven't run all these examples, but. Um, um, you should be able to, to, to get these and, and, and try them out yourself, right? Um, uh, the way Kegel works, you can actually often, you know, they, they've got some free um, um, ability to um, um, run notebooks directly on their site. So it's another thing to, 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 to check out if you haven't checked out Kegel before. Um, So what do they do? So they, they kind of go just do a straightforward regression problem and try and like a linear regression and some linear regression with some um, regularization, you know, so like lasso uh, and elastic net. Um, but then, yeah, I think they've then they in this um, tutorial that um, I, I pointed you to, they then compare that to trying to ensemble some things. So um, um, what do they try? Um, oh, they, I mean, they basically try ensembling their um, um, models that they built before, linear regression and lasso and elastic net and things like that. So. Right, the, the, the most um, helpful thing on this particular um, um, tutorial that I'm pointing you to might be on the boosting, right? Because we didn't really talk about that a whole lot um, and our textbook doesn't have that, but, but there are some things um, in um, um, scikit-learn um, for also doing some of this boosting that, that we talk about here.
So yeah, I, mean, I haven't done a whole lot of, of things with these, but um, but yeah, so you know, you see people talk about using um, XG boosting and um, um, things like this. So there's a little bit of talk about that in this tutorial here. So hopefully that'll be useful for you. Uh, if you are looking to get, to get and, and, and you know, this isn't particular, you know, if you followed um, all the stuff that we've talked about for the different machine learning, uh, supervised learning classifiers um, and regressors, right? Um, this is then useful to, to understand at least the basics about, you know, bagging, boosting and stacking kinds of ensembles and things. So. All right, so I think that's that's mostly all that I want to say. So, um, um, so I'll also and, and probably I should post an announcement about this. But um, so, <laughs> so basically, at this point, um, we're we're done kind of with supervised learning. So the last you know two or three weeks, we're going to be looking at unsupervised learning mechan um, uh, mechanisms or algorithms, which is which is a you know, quite a bit different from what we've been looking at uh, so far, but they're very useful for machine learning, right? Um, I think we're going to have basically just one more assignment and then a final test. Um, the, uh, the the assignment, I'll try and get the, the assignment posted this week, but the assignment will be um, doing some things with um, unsup unsupervised learning um, mechanisms. So, um, so mostly, um, um, it'll be some, some things working with, um, um, like, uh, some of the, the dimensionality reduction and the, um, singular body decomposition that we talk about, um, on the, uh, 13 and the 14, right? So, um, so yeah, so, you know, the, the we kind of start on this next week, I'm, 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 I'm probably not going to have... Uh, any help session uh, on Monday of next week. So Monday is only kind of a half week for Thanksgiving, uh, but I'm going to try and post this assignment here this week. Um, and then, you know, basically um, um, the, the, the last two, three weeks, um, the last two kind of full weeks um, will be const mostly concentrated on the unsupervised learning and the dimensionality reduction, right? Um, although we, um, I'll also talk a little bit that there, there's, again, this is material from our textbook chapter on some practical advice. So maybe we'll come back um, and talk about those materials, you know, which is uh, some big picture sorts of things about, you know, how you might uh, apply some of the stuff um, that, that we've learned about to, to real world sorts of uh, um, problems and things. So. Um, all right, I don't know. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and end this video, you know, if, if you guys have any, any questions about things, um, wanna ask about, you know, the deep learning class um, or, uh, oh, another reminder about that, you know, so you can use that course. I, I can get you um, um, credit for that for the um, AI and machine learning track. You know, so if you just take this course and the deep learning course, that that should be enough to satisfy the uh, the track. Even though we might not have it listed in our degree plans and things, but um, that's that's a good two course sequence for um, for satisfying track requirements. So, um, all right, yeah, and, and um, I think I'll go ahead in this video. I'll post it, um, and um, I'll see you guys later then.